Have you ever wanted to take your favorite fantasy novel and turn it into a war game? Well, today on Readers the War Game, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take one of my favorite series, Stormlight Archives, and turn it into an actual war game using Warhammer 40k rules and Warhammer 40k models. Now, there are models for the TTRPG, and when we play this out on the tabletop, which unfortunately I can't show you guys because about half of the stuff is painted and just doesn't look good, we'll be proxying anything we can in order to make it happen. So, for example, we'll have Downer Colin be the lion, and we'll proxy Downer's model for the lion. Uh, the same goes with Kaladin. He's represented by a captain with jump pack. So instead of the captain with jump pack, we will proxy in Kaladin. And that will let us really get a good feel for how it plays and what kind of cool things we can do with the feel of Stormlight Archives. Now, proxying is just going to be a little part of it. Uh, that's just to give you a little bit of flavor that we're handling. But we're doing the full game setup. So we'll be looking at everything from mission rules to the actual mission map, as well as terrain, anything we can get a hold of to really make this look as real as we can and make it feel as real as we can. And like I said, we were pretty limited on time and materials to make this happen, but we did manage to get a pretty good game in. So let's dive into it and start talking about those game details that led to a really fun game. So before we dive into the details and the nitty gritty, let's talk about why we chose Stormlight Archives to really kind of kick off this series that we've been working on along with Expeditionary Force that you saw a few weeks ago. Stormlight Archives is one of Brandon Sanderson's biggest novels with the largest amount of world building that really lets a epic fight really happen that provides a lot of really cool elements that we can bring into the gameplay itself. There are a lot of things like clear sides as well as pretty clear proxies for both sides. It allows us to bring in things like surges and unique landscapes that we wouldn't really see in Warhammer 40k, at least not in the, the simple traditional way that it's played. But we have the opportunity to really kind of zhuzh up our game a little bit and pick a world that we really enjoyed and represent it on the tabletop. On top of that, Stormlight Archives has large-scale battles in it. It's not a small epic fantasy that doesn't have a lot of back and forth. This is one that has several just massive-scale battles that can be fought on a 2,000-point-plus range to really actually represent it. It also has a lot of unique units on both sides and gives a lot of really fun stuff that we can play with to make this game a lot of fun and put a spin on Warhammer 40k that we might not be able to with just playing Warhammer. On top of that, there's a lot of themes of honor and moral dilemmas that you get with a lot of Warhammer 40k situations. Um, you get to see a lot of the mix of secrets and information that's having to be rediscovered because it's been lost. Well, people are also having to choose what's actually right and what's wrong and having to fight for everything they believe in under extreme duress. And it sets a really good stage for exactly what we want to play as Warhammer 40k players. In the Warhammer 40k universe, it's almost identical. The difference is in Stormlight Archives, it tends to be a little closer to medieval, while Warhammer 40k is in the grim dark future. But while putting this together and trying to decide how I wanted to approach this, I realized there's a lot of parallels and there's a lot of really easy proxies and similarities that we can use to actually enjoy this game and create something really, really fun. So, Let's talk about the factions that go into this and 
what it takes to really bring this to the tabletop. The first faction that we actually bring to the tabletop is the Dark Angels, who will represent the Knights Radiant and their allies. The Dark Angels provide pretty much everything we need quite easily. Just because of the breadth of the Space Marine Codex and Index, that allows us to really get a good representation on how the Knights Radiance would look in Warhammer 40k. We get to see a lot of the simple traits and cool things that I really enjoy in the way of Kings or future novels, while also getting to enjoy the things I like about Warhammer. And getting those one-to-one -one proxies is really quite simple. So with this representation, we are able to really bring everything to life, like I said, including a lot of pretty famous characters. And I've got my list over here just to my left. So I'll be glancing over there just to confirm that we've got everything covered and we can do a deep dive. I'll also be throwing pictures up here of both the, I'm probably split with one side being the Stormlight equivalent and the other side being the Warhammer 40k equivalent so that you can really see if I did any proxies on certain things. And if I didn't, if there's not really a Stormlight equivalent because it's not a character, which units I used and why. Before we dive into the characters and who they represent, you should know I did go with the Inner Circle Task Force because it gives me vowed targets. Uh, it's an ability that plays very well with the Knight's Radiant. And yes, I am aware that this also really doesn't fit with the tournament lists that you'll see from the Dark Angels, and I'm okay with it. Like I said this was fun, and it was intended to bring the Stormlight Archives into Warhammer 40k. So neither of these lists are going to be tournament optimized. They are entirely built for similarity to how the armies would work in the Stormlight Archives. First off, we need to talk about our Warlord. Now that we've talked about our detachments, Dalinar Kulin is the obvious choice for the Warlord on the Stormlight Archives side, and if you've read both series, you'll know Lions on the Forest version of Lionel Johnson is pretty much a one-to-one. -one. They have slightly different abilities, but a lot of their stories are pretty, pretty close. And on top of that, the way they play and feel on the tabletop, also really, really close. I felt it was a really obvious one, so we went with the Lion, uh, and we did proxy in the Stormlight Archive miniature that's meant for the TTRPG, so that we could actually get that feel a little bit better. Next is everyone's favorite character, Kaladin. Now, I should warn you, as we get into these characters, some of them will contain spoilers for the later Stormlight Archives books. I will try and not talk to them directly, but some of them may be there, and they're unavoidable. For example, Kaladin is... A really, really simple character to proxy if you choose the later series version of Kaladin. It's like Dalinar would be a little bit later series as well. But in order to proxy him, there's a Kaladin in shard plate model that replaces my captain with jump back. Their fighting style and play is really simple, especially if you give him the power weapon. And you play with everything that that entails. He leads a squad of Assault Intercessors with jump packs to represent his Windrunners. There are a few of the Windrunners that have models, uh, like Teft and Lopin and Rock, although Rock isn't actually a Windrunner, he's just part of Bridge 4. So I did bring in Teft and Lopin. Uh, Teft replaces the Sergeant in that squad, and Lopin takes up his spot. We did just have some generic Knight Radiant, one of which was painted as a Windrunner as well, because one of my friends is a Windrunner. So I did proxy that in as well. So it ended up being a squad of three of the Stormlight figures with just a couple of extra of the jump pack uh, intercessors to fill out the numbers. And that represents our first order of Night Radiant, the Windrunners. The next order of Night's Radiant is the Edge Dancers. Now, the leader of the Edge Dancers, Lift, is technically not an Edge Dancer. But she's close enough. She does everything that the Edge Dancers do. She just does it through cultivation instead of the Stormfather. 
And to represent her, I went with an apothecary. The edge dancers are big into healing. They are very rapid motion. So this one was a little bit different to do, but it did give me the ability to play it a little bit closer to the edge dancers. Um, I did increase the edge, edge dancers movement. So the movement didn't actually run the same way that it does with them. And for the squad of edge dancers, I just went with some simple assault intercessors. They look and feel very similar. And like I said, if you just tweak the movement, you get pretty simple edge dancers. It's not hard to represent. And that gives us the second order that we can work with. Due to time, we're not going to be able to tackle all of the orders. If you want to check out the full list to look at everything I've added and see which orders are in there and try and guess which orders are in there because unfortunately New Recruit didn't let me label them. And that was the only good way to actually build that list out. Let me know in the comments below which orders you think I've represented there. There is a hint. Mine is in there. Um, I am a stone ward, so I wanted mine represented as best as possible. But for the rest of you, we're going to jump over to the other faction, the faction of Odium, and do a brief overview of what it's like for the Chaos Space Marines to join this fight. Okay, now that we've talked about the Knights Radiant, who are the main characters, we need to talk about who they're going to be fighting, and that is the Chaos Space Marines. The Chaos Space Marines have a lot of really fun proxies that we can use when it comes to the Stormlight Archives, as well as some really cool characters and traits and on occasion some allies that we mix in there in order to really bring the feel of all of the forces of Odium, whether they be the Parshendi or the Voidbringers or even a couple of the Unmade and try and get them into this fight in a way that will properly represent some of Brandon Sanderson's creations. Now, we have some of these major characters I'm going to try and not spoil them. So I'm going to talk about the 40K equivalents in this case, and I'm going to flash a picture, but I'm not going to give names or abilities or anything like that. You'll, If you've read the books, I don't think it'll be hard to tell, but for those of you who haven't made it all the way through, it'll give you something to look forward to and watch for as you're reading the books. So I went with a couple different Chaos Lords in order to represent a few of the branches of Odium. One with Jump Pack and one in Terminator Armor. I also included a Master of Execution and a Traitor Enforcer to give a little bit of leadership and strength and stability to this army. Unfortunately, with Chaos Space Marines, I don't have as much of breadth as I do with the Dark Angels, but that's okay. The forces of Odium are controlled by a god, not so much by anything tangible or living. So for this army, I went with the Marker of Corn for everything. Odium is literally the god of anger. He will play a lot like Corn. So we just made it simple. Anything that can take a Marker of Corn will take a Marker of Corn and will fight in that style. It gives it a lot more melee heavy focus and drives them forward just like the forces of Odium, while the forces of Odium do get tactical at times, anger is what the, their driving action is. So we represented this through the Chaos Space Marines. And once again, in the description, you'll find the link to both army lists. You can go through them, figure out who the characters are. Let's try and keep the comments spoiler free. But if you want to guess which units represent who, and what combinations I used in order to represent both Odium and the Knight's Radiant, let us know in the comments below. I'd love to see your input, and if you have any suggestions or alternatives that we could use, I would love to hear that as well. So next we're going to talk about the actual mission design and how we made it feel like the Stormlight Archives. Okay, now for the real meat and potatoes of this fight. And that is the mission itself. When it comes to the actual setup, most of the Stormlight Archives, the fights take place on the plateaus of the Shattered Plains. They are large plateaus with breaks in the middle and very limited ways to cross. 
oftentimes there's bridges or other means of transportation across them in order to really bring out or really connect the two armies. So first off, I went with the Crucibles of Battle as the setup. And then we set up choke points. Uh, I use the objective markers as those choke points to represent bridges. Uh, luckily, the Stormlight Archive actually, or the TTRPG models actually come with a couple of the bridges as display pieces. So I was able to place those to represent battlefields and make them objectives, as well as either a gem heart or a different objective as well. And those are the start of the battle. But in order to give it a little bit more flavor, the mission rule I chose was a little bit different. And that is chosen battlefield. I should say I am using the Leviathan box still. I still haven't been able to get my hands on Prairie Nexus. But I feel like these rules represent it extremely well. So once again, I went with chosen battlefield which allows the players to place a couple of the objective markers. And it gives us a lot more variety to choose from. We can really bring out a lot of the fight itself. Um, it does, I do have a chasm themed model and I placed it on the battlefield as a, a corpse that they're fighting over in order to get the, the gem heart inside. And that helped a lot as well. And we were able to do a lot of really cool stuff with it. Terrain was hard, though, because a lot of the Stormlight Archives is based in a very, very rocky world. So I couldn't do my normal forest scene that I like to do, and or a forest village or outpost that we often do for 40k games. So what we had to do was actually create a way to raise two sides of the map with a chasm in between and use the bridges to get across as well as putting a few lockout croppings in the middle that they could cross um, at half the normal movement speed or a bunch of other different methods to really allow the two armies to connect. It was a lot of fun that way, especially given the primary mission, which is purge the foe. By the time the Knights Radiant actually hit the, the battlefield, it is a full-on war for, of survival for both sides. And Purge the Foe is the easiest way to represent this and really get into it with a lot of really cool stuff. I did keep both the or all of the secondary objectives the same with the defenders being the forces of Odium and the attackers being the Knights Radiant, as is typical of most of the series. Although you could just you could easily flip that as well and make it pretty simple. Um, if you have a larger dungeon build, you could also have the fight for your Ethiru. Once again, not going to go into details. That is a spoiler, but you could do that as well and get a lot more inside building fighting and get fighting inside the castle and on the grounds if you wanted to bring in that feel as well. So with all of those basics in, in place, let's talk about some of the game mechanics we added. Like I said, we did add a lot of different little things to represent the surges, but one of my favorites was the dynamic weather effect. If you've read Stormlight Archives, you know that the actual weather is one of the major parts of the story, and it allowed for a good representation of the high storm and the ruin storm. In order to represent this, we had two different dice that were set aside, one for the ruin storm and one for the high storm. The high storm charges one side and the ruin storm charges the other. Each turn, the unit gets a surge move. Every single one of the radiance or the forces of odium that use surges as well. These surges will vary based on their abilities. So the Windrunners flying would be their ability. So either they are ground troops or they can fly. If they fly that turn, that is their surge. They cannot do anything else with the surge. 
Um, just like with the edge dancers, that's healing and movement. They can either heal or they can do their rapid movement. The rapid movement is on the ground instead of flying, but it has the same distance as the edge dancers do and allows for them to slide into battle or in a different direction and gives a lot of really cool things as well. And the forces of Odium have the equivalent, but each turn you can't power everybody up because your surges are limited by stormlight or by the light pulled from the high storm. And in order to match that, the high storm dice will be rolled and the ruined dice will be rolled. Depending on what you roll, that's how many units you can power up that turn. As in a storm comes through. That storm can also rearrange the battlefield. If you roll multiple sixes in a row, that storm hits in force. And everyone has to roll their leadership in order for a saving throw to take cover. If they fail to take cover, they're battle shocked and they take damage because both storms are extremely powerful. Now, there's a lot of different ways you can do that and make it fun. That was the way we found worked best. But like I said, feel free to experiment. If you find a way that you enjoy better, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to play this game again and maybe bring some more of my friends in that enjoy Stormlight and give this a playthrough as a way to really kind of merge the two worlds. Because right now I kind of have friends that love Warhammer and friends that love Stormlight. And there's not a huge blend of, between the two. There's just a couple. Now that we've got the setup, let's talk about the narrative a little bit and get a little bit more into the character focus. Now, when it comes to Stormlight Archives, the characters are key to making the story really work. It's something that allows for a lot bigger storytelling, and it's something that I enjoy doing in this as well. Giving characters like Dalinar and Kaladin their special abilities. And, for example, Kaladin is fantastic at inspiring his troops and pushing them to do things that they didn't know they could do, as well as organization. And Dalinar is extremely powerful at leadership and on top of that he's a bondsmith which means he can pull stormlight out of the ether to recharge certain units and giving each of them the ability and aura that they carry gave them the opportunity to really feel like the characters they're representing and the forces of odium have several of these characters as well once again not going to dive into it because that is a spoiler for a lot of stuff to come but giving these unique characters even more unique abilities that felt like them is something that's a lot of fun, including Lyft having to eat food in order to actually do anything. She can't recover Stormlight because she's a knight of cultivation, not of honor. And these little character spiffs were a lot of fun. And if you're playing this game, have fun with it. Let me know what character spiff you put because every single one of them was unique. We focused a lot on the leadership qualities of Kaladin and Dalinar, as well as Lyft having to move to the back every couple turns in order to recoup her surge binding and really enjoy the game. But like I said this is pretty universal. You can do pretty much anything you want to do to represent the characters you're putting on the board. And with all of the narrative details you add and all of the fun gameplay you get, you'll get a really, really cool game that is unique to you and your friends and is something that you can enjoy a combination of a favorite book as well as Warhammer 40k. And this combination is something that I would highly recommend. So we're going to wrap up with my final thoughts and get this video over with. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. So let's dive into those thoughts. I hope you guys have enjoyed this dive into the Stormlight Archives and how we brought it to life with Warhammer 40k. And I'm super excited to see what the tabletop RPG actually brings when it's fully released. But for now, we were able to bring it to life with this instead. 
And it was really cool to see some of my favorite characters from Stormlight Archives. And it was really fascinating to see how easily we were able to proxy the two and find which characters were represented by which were my 40k characters and how their unique abilities and their surge binding was able to be played on the tabletop. And we had a lot of fun doing it. So if you have any other ideas for books you'd like to see me do videos like this on, let me know in the comments below. Also, after this is over, I'm going to be doing a couple more of the lore accurate army lists. Uh, we have Blood Angels and Salamanders that have been requested. So I think I'm going to pick a couple books, probably for the Salamanders, one from the Horus Heresy, because I haven't read many of the modern stuff. And for the, the Blood Angels, I'm going to be tackling the Devastation of Ball. Maybe. Um, I may also do some of the Horus Heresy stuff there as well to really build up that list and give you guys a snippet in time where you can get a lore accurate army for some of your favorite units. Now, let me know in the comments below if there's any other units you'd like me to tackle in that, or if, like I said, any books you'd like me to tackle like we did today. And I will see you guys next time.